Let me introduce, my pleasure to introduce our next uh, chair, the chair of our next panel, Kevin <clears throat> Murphy. Kevin is the CEO of Driscoll's with more than 20 years of experience in business and agriculture. Kevin joined Driscoll's in 2008 from Caputo Farms, where he had served for three years as president. Kevin led his, this family-owned company through a series of transformations that led to a merger of Caputo Farms with Growers Express. Prior to working at Caputo, Kevin was with Fresh Express for almost 15 years, where he headed strategic planning, marketing, and operations for the company. So his very broad experience and very deep experience. Kevin is also involved in his local community. He currently is a member of the uh, CSUMB Advisory C Council. Please give a warm welcome to Kevin Murphy. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you. I appreciate being here. And, uh, uh, you know, I think, Brad, you missed something, but I've got to be double sure. Uh, there are some students on, watching online, correct? Yes. From CSUMB and Hartnell. So I just want to welcome them as well. And uh, uh, hopefully they'll, they'll put some questions through. Uh, I don't know how they're going to do that. Maybe they can use the Twitter feed or something. But, yeah, we uh, have a communication uh, system set up for that. Okay, great. So hopefully that works. Um, so the purpose of this session is really to expose all the attendees here to some out-of-the-box thinking uh, and potential solutions that have worked in other parts of the world. So from this distinguished panel, now that we've added Dennis, especially distinguished panel, uh, we uh, I think we'll get some interesting stuff from them, uh, stuff that you may or may not have heard that I think will help us uh, sort of stimulate some of the thinking uh, as we try and solve the issues of, of water here on the Central Coast. Um, the session will be uh, broken down into uh, about 10 to 12 minutes of uh, overview from each one of the panelists. I'm going to give Dennis less because you've all heard from him before. Um, and uh, sorry, Dennis, you're going to be the butt of the joke for a while here. No. Anyway, um, uh, so they'll have about 10 to 15 minutes to talk about uh, the work they're doing. Uh, then we'll have a 30-minute facilitated discussion and then about 10, 15 minutes of questions at the end. So um, please don't forget to write your questions down on the card. Um, so be before I, uh, I start, uh, I'd like to just uh, talk a little bit by, you know, sort of answer the question, why have the CEO of Driscoll's come here and moderate, I think chair is a little bit overly ambitious term, moderate this, uh, this session. And I think there are uh, three reasons why we, uh, as a company, feel it vitally important that we participate in this dialogue around solutions for water, especially here on the Central Coast. So the first one is it's a business imperative. It's, it's, there is no way that we can continue to stay in a business without water. Um, we operate in almost uh, 30 countries around the world and sell in 60 countries. And almost half of those locations are impacted by either lack of water or quality of water. So there's no way we can sustain a business without uh, being part of the solution here. The second thing, as a company, uh, we need to demonstrate a commitment towards stewardship and leadership in this area. Since in many areas, we're one of the largest users of water. It's tough for us uh, to stand up without being part of the solution, given the amount of water we use to grow our crops. And then the last reason, which I think is probably the most important, is we've recognized that it's impossible to get to the solution without working together with various stakeholders. Um, this, in the past, we've, we've had some examples, the Paro Valley, some of you are here from the Paro Valley. Uh, that is a challenged uh, aquifer. And the bottom line there is unless community, uh, as well as industry, as well as uh, uh, folks in the community get together working on policy, we're not going to be able to solve that problem. We are proud uh, that we've started that dialogue and we've, I think we're working towards some of the solutions, but we, we recognize that it's not possible without everybody coming together around fact-based solutions. So those are the three reasons why I'm up here and why I feel personally and the company feels uh, uh, very engaged and motivated to be part of solutions going forward. Before I hand it over to the panelists, I'd like to give you a quick thumbnail sketch. Some of these uh, panelists have uh, 
very distinguished careers, so I'm not going to go through them in detail. But the first person I'd like to introduce is, is Professor Mike Young from the University of Adelaide. Mike is best known for his contribution to the development of natural resources and environmental policy. In recent times, his research has focused on the use and design of market-based instruments with attention to water. Internationally, he is known for his uh, capacity to integrate biophysical and economic information to produce innovative policy proposals that catalyze change. His impact has been felt worldwide, and his awards too numerous uh, to mention here. Examples of the policy, uh, policy proposals that have been adopted uh, due to his research include the total reform of water pastoral land leasing ag agreements in Australia, the conversion of fishery licenses into shares in New South Wales, the shift in the focus of biodiversity protection policies in Australia to ones that involve the provision of incentives for the conservation of biodiversity on private land, the unbundling of Australia's water licenses and the resultant development of an efficient trading system, and the Australian government's decision to transfer a responsibility for the administration of the Murray-Darling Basin's water resources to an independent expertise-based authority. Closer to home, he has been involved in proposals for the transformation of water rights in the Western US and for the introduction of groundwater sharing systems in California. So Mike, I'd like to bring you up to the, to the podium and uh, welcome you here. Thanks. I thought I was speaking last. Now I'm speaking first in the panel. <laughs> Surprises come. Um, I wanted to share with you a couple of sort of my favorite slides that I use when I talk about water in, yes? We've got Jim, are we supposed to? <laughs> I'll do your talk. We've got something wrong here. Yeah. There should be a slide in the back that's called Mike Young's Water. It's called Monterey, I think, but we've got the wrong slide up there. Um, while they're fixing up and catching up, what I was going to show you was my first and most favourite slide, um, which was how much money was made from water reform in Australia. And I learnt this most of all working in Nevada, and I walked into a group of groundwater users who were desperate about what to do with their depleting water resources and the fact that their land prices, their farm prices were going down and they were finding it hard to sell their farms and they realised they were in crisis. I came in and said, well, we had a situation like that in Australia and when we changed the new system and we admitted as a community that our water rights system was dysfunctional, was designed for an era that no longer existed, and we changed to a new system, the value of the water share system we created went up 20% per annum for a decade. Never went under 15%. And I said to him, shall I leave now and go home or do you want to talk about it? <laughs> they all sat bolt upright, they got out their calculators and within 20 minutes, one of the farmers said, stop, why don't we do this? Who wants to do it? And they all put their hands up. They now have a water sharing system. Mike, you're on. We're on? I think. No, we're not on. Yes. And we've got display problems as well. You're doing such a good job without the slides, eh? Okay, let's, I'm going to abandon my slides. <laughs> if you can catch up and make them work, please do. Um, the next slide was the other lesson. If you're going to manage uncertainty in the future, what's the state of the art in the world? The lesson Australia learned was that you need to create water resources that are defined as shares. You don't know how much water is going to be available in the future. And so what you need to do is to build a sharing system. It's well known. It's what made America great. Apologies to Trump. But you need a way to share water. And when you share water and define ownership as shares, the value of those shares, have a simple rule. If somebody wants more, someone has to take less. When you have that, you have a robust allocation system that works. The next really important thing is how do you keep it simple? It was first worked out 3,000 years ago. Has anybody 
in this room got a bank account? Yes. Has anybody in this room got a water account? Imagine if you could all write water checks to each other. If everybody at the start of the year had a credit with how much water was in it, as you used it, it was debited. And if all of you in this room trusted that system and knew that if you wanted more water, you'd have to find somebody prepared to transfer water to you. So the second big lesson that comes out of Australian water reform and what happened in Australia was to build a sharing system and a banking system that was trusted. I've been out down in Bakersfield um, three days ago talking to farmers down there. And so it's really interesting. If you're growing oranges or if you're here, you're growing lettuces. And if your neighbour came and started picking your oranges or taking your lettuces, you'd have the sheriff there in 30 seconds saying, hey, stop. But those oranges and those lettuces are produced using groundwater. And everybody's relaxed about taking each other's groundwater. If you need a system that works, you have to have trust, community credibility. So the challenge for things like Sigma is, in fact, to build a system that everybody trusts. And that's what Australia did by building a thing. And if the slides were working, which they're obviously not, I would show you what a water account would look like. A very, very simple bank account. And if you wanted to trade water to somebody, you just click and trade, trade it across. The bad news, which Australia learnt the hard way, is reform is very difficult. And that for a long, long time, we argued about water rights and protecting them. And the system we had didn't work. It wasn't designed to work. It didn't have hydrological integrity. People just helped themselves to water. Building a system that was designed to work no matter what happened was built around a very simple idea that the system had to be robust, had to have integrity. <coughs> the share registers had to be easily acceptable, accessible, guaranteed to always be current, and to be structured so that the banks could easily register a mortgage against them. We sat down and worked out how to register mortgages for about $100 a mortgage. Guaranteed to work, no problems. The value of those water shares took off. Within five years, it had doubled, and it doubled again. I think we have our slides back. But the clicker now doesn't work. <laughs> um, the concept that underlies what Australia did is very, very simple. Um, can you keep on clicking through and we'll catch up? And these are simple concepts, but the really important thing we did is to have a water accounts that look like your bank account that look like this. Every farmer in Australia can log in, see how much water they've got day by day. A water manager can add up all the water accounts and see how much water is left in the basin. Wouldn't that be amazing? If you're running a business, all the business people at Driscoll's knows how much cash, what stock they've got right throughout the business globally, continuously. They think that's fundamental. The revolution we brought to Australia was to build systems that said our water managers had to manage water like a business. It's a very simple concept. The governance arrangements were also really important, really important to get right. It's all right. Um, <laughs> um, can we just keep on clicking these through, catch up? Um, how do you put a sharing system in place? We took the existing rights and did what we called unbundling them. So you give people shares, a long-term stake and a long-term interest. You give people water accounts that look like bank accounts and a use approval, the third part of it, so that people have to have water in their water account. Very, very simple. And then we built plans that were not the plans America is currently proposing to build with Sigma, which document the extent of the problems, what sustainable yield is. Instead, we set up the rules of the game. We're going to live within limits, set the limit, force everybody to respect the system and build local governance systems that are trusted. And that is the secret. All of you in this room will know what an old broken down car's worth. You drive up to the lights out here and it breaks down, you ring up AAA, they get it going again, you go a bit further and it breaks down again. Imagine if you could trade that car in 
and get a state-of-the-art, a Tesla or a, a Prius, whatever it is, a car that you knew, you knew confidently would drive you from here to New York without breaking down and it would be comfortable all the way. A well-designed water management system would be like that. And that's what we set around building. So we built and sat down and said, what's the state of the art in governance? You don't need big representative um, governance boards where everybody's representative and after the meeting they go home or they go outside to the media and hold a press conference and say, the board just made the wrong decision. And they go back to the people they were representative and say, I tried, but I couldn't make it happen. A system that has credibility, the people who make the decision are proud of the decision and they know the system has to work. You do not find companies letting their staff go out having made a decision and tell them they got the wrong decision publicly. If you want a system that has credibility, it's critical that you have small boards who are appointed for their expertise and are expected to make the system work. When you're serious about water management, you do that. The challenge for Sigma at the moment is most of the Sigma boards are big and are representative. The lesson Australia learnt the hard way is you need people who can make decisions confidently and make decisions as fast as water supply conditions change. And that means you have to be able to make a final binding decision within a week and never ever put a system in place that enables it to go off to a three or four year court case. When you work through and look at the ways, there are opportunities to do this in Californian law. And at the same time, to look after, look after disadvantaged communities. And what I've been doing, working through in the last year, as much as I can, and working with local groups, is to write up a model groundwater sustainability plan that brings all of this to this state. And it's been interesting when you sit down and talk to farmers about what type of water system do you need and what's your current groundwater right. They'll say, we've got a groundwater right. But what is it? They don't know. How much water are they allowed to take? They don't know. As much as they want. But everybody knows that that's no longer the situation. And when I go to places like Portable and talk to the land valuers, particularly where there's only groundwater, land values are going down. And ask them why and say, oh, because we don't know what's going to happen. When that happens in a community, it stops investing and it stops innovating. Turning around and building a system that works is really probably the most important thing to do, to build a system that has integrity and works. And that, probably more than anything, is the lesson that comes from Australia. If you have a system that's dysfunctional, work out how to transform through to one which has function and which is designed to work. And I suggest to you that's about defining the opportunity to take water in the long term as a share, seeing that as the capital value of the resource you have, setting up an accounting system that accounts all the, for all the things that are happening, including recharge. You heard in the earlier panel people talking about recharge. But why would you put water into an aquifer if you don't know it's yours to take out in the future? A credible system would allow you to put water into an aquifer and see it credited to your water account. If a district as a whole does it, they would have a district-wide account and they would then decide who gets it. And they can then talk about who's going to pay for it. When we did this, as I said earlier on, the value of water took off. It took off by people looking after it. The structural change that occurred was massive and the most exciting part for me was going back into depressed rural communities and talking to the people who were no longer looking down at the ground and saying, what are we going to do <coughs> to a community that had pride, that was prosperous and was going places. And seeing the innovation come, the companies flocking from all over the world to come and invest locally to profit from the opportunities of using water wisely. I have a vision which is built around doing that in California starting with local groundwater in places like Salinas, Porterville, um, Bakersfield, putting such systems in place. And the good news is that plans like this can be written, 
within six months, adopted locally by a community with a commitment to do it, the detail can then work out as you go forward. And that, I think, is what California needs. And if you do that, you will become, to my shame, world leaders. And I will no longer be here and being asked to come because there'll be somebody here from Salinas being asked to go back to Australia to say, how do you do this better than we did it? And that would be very, very exciting. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, Mike, that was pretty impressive. To, to, uh, to work that uh, ably uh, tells me you knew a lot about your topic and uh, so we appreciate it. Um, so have we fixed the slides? It doesn't look like it. So I, I'd, I'd like to go to the next speaker. Uh, Ursula, you ready to do without slides? I will try. Yeah. OK. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Next up is Dennis. <laughs> so Dennis, De uh, Dennis, uh, I've known Dennis for 30 years. Uh, we worked together at Fresh Express. There's probably no better person to represent uh, the various uh, uh, stakeholders in the valley. Dennis is a, has worked in farming, he's worked in for uh, ag companies, he's worked as the mayor of Salinas. So he, if anyone understands the, the balance between urban and rural in terms of this issue, it's Dennis. Uh, I could go through his bio, which I'll save you, um, but I'd like Dennis to come up and, and uh, speak to us. And other than the fact I'm not very good at PowerPoint, this is why I don't use slides, so. <laughs> anyway, uh, well, I, I, I didn't expect to be in front of you in this manner, but uh, I was asked to talk a little bit uh, about uh, what Western Growers uh, is doing around innovation and water. As, as, as we've heard, uh, there's, a lot of policy, there's a lot of policy and, and regulation involved in, in water, and, West, and what Western Growers decided to do a couple years ago uh, in order to address the challenges of the future, that it was important to be proactive and that innovation and technology needed to be part of the mix. So when the board got together a few years ago, and Kevin, Kevin's on the board, there was a determination of there were three big macros. Not surprisingly, a couple years ago, water was certainly one of them. And the focus was supply and quality. And I think, as, you, <laughs> as you've heard, Supply is really a function of policy, regulation, but quality most, most certainly uh, is, is an issue of, of innovation, technology, and, and science. And so the physical manifestation of the commitment of the board was to uh, open up the Innovation Center starting in Salinas because there was a lot of early momentum around all of the, all of the uh, ag tech uh, discussions that were, were taking place. But, one of the things that's important about Western Growers is it sounds Western, it sounds domestic, and its membership base is California and Arizona, which is responsible for 50 plus percent of North America's fresh fruits and vegetables and nuts. But most of the players, like Driscoll, are year round. So West, Western Growers is operating, its membership is operating in 32 states and 30 countries. So when you hear Kevin talk about the impact of water all over, all over the world in order to serve our members, we have to be thinking globally. And when you think about uh, technology and innovation and entrepreneurship and new, new companies and trying to scale, you, you have to have a global, global mentality. And so one of the things that we have, and, and, and I like the fact we called it an innovation center because the, the, because answers can come from all over the world. So one of the things as we opened up uh, the innovation center, we, we, we presumed, I don't know how many of you have seen the internship with Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson, I encourage you to all go out and get it because as I tell everyone in Western Growers, understand this, hire Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson to do nothing for your business, but the, the kids that surround them on the Google campus, they're gonna solve our problems. and. We, but we also found that innovation is not just young companies. 
that there are company, the companies and countries who have dealt with, with our issues um, for many, many years longer than we have. So we are pleased as we open up the center within just over a year and a half, we have 50, 50 companies in the center, but the international representation is significant. So we, we have companies from New Zealand, Brazil, uh, we have a, we have a cu couple of uh, um, German, Australia, um, we, and I made sure we got the Irish. I thought that was important. And, uh, and the Israelis, and what we're finding, and if you just look at my schedule in the last week, I have had in town the Koreans, the French, and the Dutch. And so one of the things that I would just throw in in closing, because Kevin's got me on a short leash, and that's good for all of you, is California is like New York. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Because many of these companies are mature in their own marketplace, but they either need to scale to attract more investment or they need new markets. So California is like New York. It is the destination of choice globally if you have an innovation, innovative solution. And I think that's an important opportunity for us because if you think about the first question you heard today, you heard some of the best practitioners in the business executing the tools of their trade, government, and policy. And so what Western Growers is trying to bring to the mix is how can we bring innovation and technology and new players to the game to accelerate solutions. So that, that's what we're up to in Salinas, and, uh, and, uh, and I, I certainly want to uh, certainly confirm as you will hear that we there are, gr there are great solutions all over the world and we sh we sure can use from our friend learn from our friends and, and we hope western growers can be a conduit to some of those solutions so. thanks dennis i appreciate you uh, saying a few words so our third guest uh, is professor urs van guten i hope i got that right urs okay yeah. Uh, from the Swiss Federal Institute Aquatic Science and Technology. Wow, how do you remember that? It's tough. Anyway, he is an internationally recognized expert in water quality and treatment and has co-authored one book and more than 200 publications in peer-reviewed journals. He has received several international awards. Besides his academic activity, he has a long history of collaboration with projects related to water quality and treatment, water resource protection, enhanced wastewater treatment to remove nitrates, water recycling, and experience in the Rhine River Basin, which had to bring many countries together, not counties or whole states, but many countries together to solve uh, water problems within that basin. So it's my pleasure to, in to introduce you and welcome first to the, to the podium. And I hope the slides work. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I feel a little bit exotic because I'm from a country where we don't have water quantity issues so much. I, I mean, Switzerland is not known to be an arid country. So, uh, you know, the whole issue of uh, dividing water between the municipal sector and uh, agriculture is not such prevalent, not, not so prevalent there. So, but you will see I uh, chose uh, the example of the Rhine River because you, it also shows you uh, how one has to solve sim uh, similar problems and also a whole suite of different problems at the same time. And I think from a conceptual point of view, it's not so different from what you're facing here. So I'm a little bit nervous with this presentation now. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's not in presentation mode, but it's okay, you know. You have a smaller picture there, but at least you have one. <laughs> so the River Rhine, and this is now a little bit dumb because there is uh, uh, some animation there, but uh, basically it goes from uh, Switzerland all the way to the North Sea, to the Netherlands. And uh, basically what you can see there is, you know, at the beginning it's a really pristine mountain stream, and then by the time it go, comes to the Netherlands, it has been more, more or less 100% recycled. So basically it's uh, you know, 50 million people, so a little bit more than the population of, uh, of um, California, 
they depend on the Rhine River as a drinking water resource, but also as a sewer. So you see this, this constant change, and I will show you how uh, one can cope with it. In terms of the size of the river, I would say it's maybe similar to the Colorado River, so you have a, an impression, you know, what you, what you should think of. I think one difference is that the system is better buffered because, you know, the origin of the river is in a glaciated area, so even in the summertime there is constant flow, whereas uh, in the Colorado River you can run out of water uh, at some points in, in the, during the, the season. Next slide. So, you know, early on, already in the 1950s, with the increasing industri industrialization around the River Rhine, and there's a heavy industrialization around the River Rhine, uh, a lot of chemical industry, uh, the countries that are connected to the River Rhine, they realized that they have to do something. They were, you know, it was basically becoming a sewer of uh, these countries. And uh, in 1950, Switzerland, France, and... Uh, Germany, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg, they founded this Rhine Commission to improve the quality of the, of the River Rhine uh, water. And at the beginning, you know, there were issues like the, the salt load, but then also the nutrient load was uh, tremendous. You know, nitrogen is the minimum element for eutrophication in the coastal area of the North Sea, so they had a huge uh, nutrification problem. And this uh, triggered a lot of investment. Only in Switzerland was like one billion US dollar per year over the last 50 years was invested into the wastewater management. So this was really an enormous investment. Similar amounts proportional to the, uh, the population were also invested in Germany and the Netherlands and France. So this was really a, a, a very important concerted action. And then of course also the you know, the load of heavy metals became an issue at some point. Uh, but then the River Rhine is also very important for car cargo shipping. So this had also to, to be taken into consideration. And then, of course, also the ecological aspects. So then uh, in 1986, these pictures went uh, around the world. This is the Santo catastrophe. So there was a fire in one of the chemical companies uh, upstream uh, at the Swiss border. And so basically you see the, this fire, they tried to extinguish it. There were lots of chemicals, pesticides, insecticides, mercury-containing compounds. They all got into the River Rhine. And down there you see the fish. So basically the river was dead after that incident. And uh, this was, of course, a major milestone in the development of the uh, water quality of the River Rhine. It was also in the same year where, when we had Chernobyl, the nuclear catastrophe of Chernobyl, and also in the early 80s there was a big discussion about the dying of forests in Europe. So this was basically the time when, you know, action was coming very quickly. And next slide. So the ministers uh, of the countries that uh, are in the basin of the, of the River Rhine, they came together and they, within 11 months, they developed uh, an action plan with concrete uh, goals for improvement of the River Rhine and one of them was uh, actually to bring the salmon back into the River Rhine. So this was kind of the symbol and uh, there's a beer bottle there which uh, says Salmon Broi so salmon brew, and uh, you know, this was uh, common in the old days before the in industrialization. The salmon would, all, would come up all the way to the Rhine River, to the, to the origin, and uh, at basically this was then the goal to, to, to uh, fulfill. And uh, I think they're still working on it, but uh, it has already improved dramatically. So there were also some new aspect, aspects coming into it, like climate change. So, you know, our glaciers, they will be disappeared by the end of the century. So what does it mean to the constant flow of the River Rhine? It will probably change. Also flood management, we have more heavy uh, rain uh, storms 
And so this also is really a big problem, especially for countries like the Netherlands, because their, you know, their surface is sometimes below the level of the, of the River Rhine. And uh, also in the, in the whole chemical discussion, you know, there was a shift from just industrial discharge also to municipal discharge. And uh, there, they installed an extensive monitoring program for uh, chemical contamination in the River Rhine. So now I would like to discuss briefly what it means to get uh, drinking water from the River Rhine. And I will talk about two locations. One is in Basel, that's at, uh, north of Switzerland, where the Rhine leaves Switzerland, and then in the Netherlands. So the recycling fraction in Basel is about 10%, so it's about 10% is wastewater. And you have to know about 70% of Switzerland discharges into the River Rhine. So 70% of the wastewater of Switzerland goes into the River Rhine. And uh, in the Netherlands, it's uh, 30 to 60 percent, uh, but it can also be higher than that. So it's almost uh, wastewater yeah, that you have to treat there. So uh, in principle, you know, along the River Rhine, uh, the water supplies, they uh, rely heavily on riverbank filtration or art artificial infiltration, so to use these natural cleaning processes. And then in addition, they put in some physical chemical barriers and of course, the number of barriers, barriers increases as you go down the river Rhine. So I will show you one exa example a little bit upstream and one in the Netherlands. Next slide. So, um, yeah, this is now a little bit messed up because you actually cannot see uh, what you should see. So this is, is an aerial view of the area of Basel. And you can see it's, it's heavily populated, it's heavily industrialized. You see the River Rhine there. And uh, underneath this picture, there's actually a protection zone they installed. It's like a forest area where River Rhine water is infiltrated into the underground to replenish the, the, the groundwater and actually build a groundwater mountain that you keep out the dirty water from the industry. There is like a, a cargo uh, train station where they load chemicals. There are waste deposit sites in the area. There are chemical industry. There are uh, freeways in this area. So you have to really make sure that this water doesn't get into your groundwater field. And the detailed picture you see there is actually they have installed these channels where the Rhine water is infiltrated. And uh, there's about eight meters of water going into these channels every day. So, and this uh, a, a system of channels and ponds where this water is infiltrated and replenishes the, the underground. Next slide. So this is a schematic view, how it's done. So the river line is abstracted, then there is a separation of particles, uh, and then it's infiltrated in, uh, in this forest. And uh, basically, this is a, an important biological treatment step. So the biology really takes care of a lot of the contamination in there. And then afterwards, it goes through activate the carbon and then the UV disinfection. And the water is then distributed without any chlorine residual. So it's good enough to be distributed. And down here, you see the number of micropollutants. So we did a, like a target analysis with 500 micropollutants, and in the River Rhine you find about 100. Uh, in the particle removal, you know, you don't remove any micropollutants. In the infiltration, it goes down to about uh, 40 compounds, so you remove 60% of these compounds, and after activate the carbon, you can barely find anything. So this is really a, a system where you can treat this uh, more charged water. Next slide. So then this is an example of how it can be done further downstream in the Netherlands. And uh, the traditional way is shown to the left where you have this pretreatment, then UV peroxide, GAC, and then it goes into the dunes. So they also do a lot of dune filtration, which can uh, help by biological processes in the dunes. 
uh, a more advanced way would be like uh, ultrafiltration with re reverse osmosis. But then they also developed uh, the process to the right where you have like uh, an ion exchange and then a microfiltration, UV peroxide, and biological activated carbon. So there's a whole portfolio that they are applying now, and depending on the details of the water quality, they will go more into one or the other direction. And the last slide I wanted to share with you is actually a new strategy of, uh, in Switzerland. It's called the strategy micropollutants. And the Swiss EPA has, uh, by a big program of research that went over 15 years, they came to the conclusion that they uh, recommend an upgrade of uh, municipal wastewater treatment plants for micropollutant removal. And this is mainly out of ecological reasons. It also, of course, has benefits for the drinking water that is extracted, but it's mainly due to ecological reasons. And this had to go to the, through the Swiss Parliament. This was decided in 2016. And now we are in the phase of implementation. So it means that uh, about uh, 100 out of the 700 wastewater treatment plants in Switzerland will be upgraded with an additional step for micropollutant removal and uh, over the next 20 years. And the costs will be in the order of uh, about 1.2 billion US dollars. And uh, the costs, the returning costs every year will be 120 million Swiss francs. And this will cost about 10 US dollars per person per year, and this will be taxed. So there is an additional tax that goes on the wastewater. This was also uh, a negotiation process that had, we had to find how to do it, and this was agreed on. And uh, I think this is really something that uh, I find is uh, very nice that we find, found this possibility to actually do it. You know, there's a lot of discussion also in other European countries in Germany, the Netherlands, France, but they didn't come to a conclusion how to solve this problem yet. Thanks, Urs. Appreciate that. So uh, what we're going to try to do now is have a facilitated discussion um, where I have some questions prepared, and I'll ask uh, either uh, all three of the folks to answer or one or other. So, and then I th we'll still want to try to keep maybe 10 minutes for, uh, for questions from the, uh, from the uh, audience. So I'd like to start with Mike and ask him this question. In your experience, what does it take to build trust and allow stakeholders to come together to advance solutions? And within that, how important is trust as data uh, in that whole building of trust? Um, you, start, you start with trust, you build trust, and as soon as you lose it, the whole system falls to bits. So that's number one lesson that comes out of Australia. How do you get the trust? You work with the community, and you must have a very, very simple story, a very simple image of what you're really building. If you cannot describe the system you're trying to build in under one minute, you cannot get trust. People don't believe you when politicians or community leaders waffle on about doing stuff and getting it right and getting it nearly there and we'll work out how to deal with these difficult problems. They don't believe you. You go and say we're going to give every one of you in this room a share, give every one of you a water account, and we're going to insist that everybody complies with it. Everybody understands. The next part of building trust is to go to who are the most critical people in the community to ensure the industry trusts it. Yesterday, I spent the morning with the Californian Bankers Association for good reason. I asked the Bankers Association, would they endorse the system where there was a share register that was bankable, mortgageable, and guaranteed, and that would be the only way rights to groundwater would be defined? And would they bank against an accounting system that looked just like bank accounts? And they said, yes. How do we help? If you get the banking industry going to your farming industry and saying, we like this, we want it to happen, 
then people start talking seriously about it. So it's about design. It's also about very, very good leadership and governance, very thorough discussion, and importantly, not talking only to the big end of town. The other lesson that comes out in the engagement is it's very, very important to include disadvantaged communities in the design. So in the mock-up that I've prepared for groundwater systems, there's a rule in there that says the county and cities will have to hold shares on behalf of all small-scale groundwater users, all households. So then they have free access. But the sharing system ensures that if more disadvantaged people take water, the county has to solve the problem by getting water from somebody else. These are obvious things to do. You have to account for everything, you have to do it fairly, and you have to set priorities that ensure that disadvantaged communities get water. You have to put together sharing systems that say <coughs> the allocation per share can go to zero. But when it does, disadvantaged communities will continue to have access. If you have salinity intrusion, you have to have a mechanism to deal with it. The mechanism to deal with in the robust system is to have permits that still issue shares, but say you cannot take water from these areas. But there's an automatic compensation process in place. And you build in incentives so that if the amount of water goes down, the value of shares go up. I could go through the detail, but it's through intelligent design and having leaders who can communicate exactly and precisely what will happen, and who can guarantee there will be a water account for every land parcel in Salinas. And there will be an, a monitoring system that tracks how much water is being used on every land parcel. We have those systems in Australia. They don't take long to build. They take an investment. You do have to put metres in some parts of the system, not everywhere, but it can be done. And the investment is not that expensive. Great, thanks, Mike. Urs, I have a question for you. So innovative solutions don't appear out of thin air. You know, in, in your example that you used, Chair, what work had to occur in advance to establish a foundation for these solutions? Uh, often we have a crisis, but there's work to be done before the crisis, I believe. Do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, the, you know, maybe I can... Uh, give you a little bit more background about our institute. So I'm working at the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology. And this is an institute uh, with about 700 people who all work in the water field. So we have uh, established a long-term collaboration with the stakeholders in Switzerland uh, to, with all kinds of water issues, but also we have a very good uh, connection to the Swiss EPA. Uh, so basically, the Swiss EPA uh, funds part of our research. So I think, you know, already from, from this uh, con construct, uh, we are not really surprised by any issues that come up, unless it's like an accident. Of course, nobody could have predicted this uh, catastrophe in uh, 1986. But already there, I think, uh, you know, my institute reacted very quickly in first measures, uh, sampling campaigns, you know, prediction of, you know, the, the uh, pollutant wave going down the, the river line, etc. So, you know, sometimes it, it takes like a catastrophe like this. But also the, you know, for example, this, this, uh, issue with upgrading of uh, wastewater treatment plants for micropollutant removal was actually triggered by observation of uh, fishermen that they saw that like the, the fish uh, catch actually declined in Swiss rivers. And this triggered uh, basically three big research programs, uh, one on fish decline, one on endocrine disruptors, and then finally on micropollutants. Uh, to assess the situation and then also to find the solutions for it. So this was uh, funded by mostly by the uh, Swiss EPA then because they thought, you know, they really have to assess this problem and also if it turns out to be a problem, uh, actually address it, it with, the, with the necessary technologies. 
All right, thanks, Urs. Dennis, this one's for you, and I know I'm going to catch you a little off guard here, so I, bear with me. Okay. So, but I think your, your, your entire career has been in different segments of, 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 of society or community. So the question I have is, uh, for each of these stakeholders, how were the needs of society and environment balanced to garner effective water solutions? You know, how, did, how did you, when you were working in government, working for ag, how did you balance all that? How did, how did you think about that? Well, that's a difficult question to answer publicly. I could, I could, I could. <laughs> there, there may, there may be uh, people in the room who, um, I, I, um, I, I think, I think the answer is, and, and let, let me, let me put on a, my hat as a former, former mayor. What, what I tried to do, un understanding I represented the common good in the office, didn't belong to me. It belonged to the community. That that was my guiding star. That that's what I was there to there to do. Uh, in a in a role now with uh, the WGA, our our focus, my focus, and my appropriate role is to guide the innovation strategy. Knowing knowing full well that uh, WGA is known far and wide as you know that's certainly the uh, the grower's voice uh, in Sacramento and Washington, but that's not what I'm doing. So it's so it's so it's appropriate for me to say, having heard the first panel, <coughs> that as they use their toolbox, you know what we're trying to throw in is uh, either global companies who bring new solutions or young companies. Uh, how can innovation enter the game? So so I just simply try and be guided by um, what uh, what hat I, hat I'm wearing, and and I think that's. I, I think that's the b best way to do it, or it was certainly the best way for me to try and approach it. So now we need to put you on the spot. Are they mutually exclusive in some ways, or is there a, is there a happy medium somewhere there? Um, I, you know, I think the answer is f from time to time they appear to be on the surface, and and in fact, when you get to the end of the line, they can be mutually exclusive. But I think the obligation is is always. Um, to get everybody in the room, as you heard, uh, identify all of the issues, and 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 then really focus on that common ground where you can get it, and then build out from there, and then see if that get get gets uh, the best outcome for the common good. It, it, you know, in the end, from time to time, they certainly have. They, they weren't necessarily for me, but obviously, they certainly can be, depending upon different stakeholders' point of view. Okay, great. Thanks. So. Um, Given time uh, constraints, there's about 15 minutes left, and I really want to get to, I, I don't know, about 20 different questions here. They're a little bit better than Dennis on this one, so I've got some competition here. Um, so I'd like to start off with a question for Mike from the audience. How long did it take for Australia to set up its water share system, and when was it up and running, and for how long now? That's a very difficult question to ask. The conversion to shares first happened in 2000 across an entire state of New South Wales. An act was passed that required all of the water systems to be unbundled. We were lucky we had a massive drought, which was worse than any drought California has ever seen. And in 2004, inspired by what was happening in a number of states and seeing local demonstration, the nation as a whole um, committed to a thing called a National Water Initiative which required every state in Australia to start the journey of converting over. Um, prior to that, and what's often not talked about, is the fact we spent a lot of time building community respect for the system and setting limits in the total amount that could be used and an awkward journey towards setting up opportunities to trade water, which were messy and difficult in the early stages, and a lot of effort was put into building the systems that now have incredible transparency and enable everybody to get involved. When I look in America, I'm staggered by the number of water lawyers. If I went into any water-using community in Australia, I couldn't convene a meeting of water lawyers to talk to me. Everywhere I go around America, I sit down with 10 or 20 water lawyers in the room, fascinated to talk about what they're going to do next if the systems I'm talking about come into being. We don't have water lawyers. 
the system works. Most of you in this room would own shares. Do you use share lawyers to sort out whether or not you really own shares in the investments you have? Are you worried about the fact that if you sell them shares you might have to get legal advice to make sure that in fact you're able to do it? Well-designed systems don't need lawyers. I spoke recently in Bakersfield to a company, a large company, who last year spent 18 million US dollars employing lawyers in adjudications. 18 million dollars. And that was just one side of the party. Is that a functional system? All right. Well, how do you really feel about that? <laughs> did, you, did you want an answer? <laughs> yes. <laughs> So let's change, change, change subject here a little bit. Urs, uh, so this is a question. Does the Rhine Water Commission regulate chemicals used by agriculture in order to protect drinking water quality? If so, could you generally describe the process? Well, within the European Union, there is the, this reach, which basically uh, the, is the framework to, to get uh, permission for new chemicals. So they are assessed by certain criteria. But uh, in principle, you know, other chemicals, they are not regulated, they will be used. And uh, this is actually, you know, in, because in Switzerland, but also other European countries, you know, the, the municipal contribution of micropollutants is something that will be solved now. So the next one will be the agriculture, and uh, in the recent study in Switzerland, we have seen that you know many of the small streams they contain pesticides in very high concentrations above the levels that would be uh, good for the ecosystems. But uh, this is of course something that uh, is a problem because the, you know, the stakeholders in the parliament for agriculture are much stronger than they, the stakeholders for the environment. And uh, the regulations uh, on the agricultural side are less strict than for many other environmental issues. So I think this will be a very difficult negotiation process. You know, there is like food production versus the environment and this is something that the society really has to decide, you know, in what direction it wants to go. I mean, we have already done a lot of uh, measures uh, to go more to, like, uh, organic production in Switzerland. So the, the farmers, they get uh, subsidies if they, if they do that. But then on the other hand side, we also import a lot of food uh, from, from abroad. You know, Switzerland can only feed about 50% of the population, the rest has to be imported. And then we get into a whole other discussion with uh, the virtual water that we actually import. You know, Switzerland as a water-rich country actually imports water because we protect our environment locally and produce elsewhere. And I think that's also uh, then a more global issue, you know, where should we actually produce uh, uh, agricultural goods, but uh, to to make the the answer short, yeah, we we don't have such regulations in place. I mean, there is like, you know, the, the regulations are uh, a little bit softer in terms of the agricultural practice. You know, the there is like agricultural research institutes in Switzerland. They give advice to farmers how to apply it, etc. But then in the end. Uh, it's a little bit out of, uh, out of control. Uh, Mike, a question for you again here. Um, one of the questions is, how do you determine how much water is available to create water accounts? So what's the sort of underlying data that sort of establishes that water account, so to speak, or that bank account? In most areas, you start at a, a um, regional level, the aquifer, and you start by just working out how much water was used last year and you allocate that amount as where you start. And then if you know it's too much, you start reducing it down and you ratchet forward step by step until you discover that the groundwater table is no longer going down. And hey presto, you're there. Um, if you want to, you can employ lots of scientists to build complicated models around how you do it. 
But if you reduce use at 3% um, per year for 10 years, you've, over, you've actually halved water use in a district. So the journey's quite quick. At an individual level, you need a monitoring system in place. In areas where there's only groundwater, the good news is you can now use satellite imagery to track that, provided you have a land parcel register which is always current. In most parts of America, the land parcel register is normally about six to 12 months behind. One of the other big innovations we had to do in Australia, which we did actually over 100 years ago, was build a register which defined who owns what. The only way you can own land is if your name is on the register. And we've run processes to get everybody off an old system, a paper system title to the new modern register, so you always know who owns what at any stage, which is necessary if you're going to build an accounting system that is trusted. So counties, we have new this, um, or else for water managers, you have to build another system to track who owns land parcels day by day. In systems where there's ground and surface water, if you want to give credit for recharge, then you need to meter the gross amount of water that's taken from a surface water system, work out how much of the vapor transpired, and as a result of that, how much goes through into the groundwater. That can be done, I won't go into the detail, um, but there's systems around that are very affordable that do that. And if you're a person who has some surface water and you apply it and flood irrigate onto an area of land, you might put half a million dollars worth of water on. Isn't it interesting if the surface water user then gets credit for the 20% that goes through and they discover they've just been given credit for $100,000 worth of water which they used to put freely into the aquifer? When you do that, they suddenly think much more seriously about the relationship between surface water use and groundwater use and I would predict that very soon you'll find that you won't just have shares in your groundwater system, you'll have irrigators who take surface water wanting to have a surface water sharing system, as Australia now has, that goes throughout our rivers and throughout all our aquifers, and incentives and connections between the two so that everything is optimised continuously day by day. Great, thanks Mike. Dennis, this is a question for you. At Western Growers and the Innovation Centre, you know, this area of, of water supply and perhaps even demand and coming up with solutions, are, how are you actually trying to incentivize some of these uh, startups to get after that particular issue? Is it something you talk about? Uh, how, how, how do you think about that at the Innovation Center? Well, I, we, we think about it from a couple standpoints in, in terms of we, we certainly try and do strategic outreach to, uh, to get the attention of companies that are are working on the issue and I think one of the things to point out about the issue is water is the most obvious resource in terms of you know the backdrop of we have to do more than more with less so I think one of the things that uh, we also try and point out that there there may be folks working on extraction technologies but water is also kind of the gathering spot for all things of precision ag and all of the elements of of ag tech innovation, so whether it's whether it's drones, data analytics, sensors, you know, we no, we now live in a world, and I think you've heard it laid out pretty pretty well. Uh, keeping keeping score with what you're doing on the farm is really really important. So it's not just a focus on water; it's the ability to to gather data so you can so you can comply with the government. And then the other thing is the marketplace conditions. Uh, with when you have consolidated customers. They want to know information, and they want to know information also around water as part of some of the metrics and sustainability is a big one. So, so with that that in mind, we talk about water, but we also try and breed collaboration with the companies who are in there. Hey, you're working on a water solution, but let's get together with the data solution because those things come together to help provide solutions for the members. And then the last thing I'll mention is just events like this. Uh, this, this, is, this is a terrific one in, in, in Monterey County, but we move around the state. So last, last March, uh, we worked with uh, Dale over here over, over in Fresno. So you, know, you, have, you have to get the word out, you have to promote, and, uh, but, but I'd say strategically recruit, uh, build collaboration and program. 
Mike's got some uh, thoughts on that. And in code, Dennis has just told you that in precision agriculture works and that smart farmers have all the data that's needed to run a good system. They know exactly how much water they're using, where it's going. All you need to do is to build the companies locally here that also build the systems that add it all up so you can work out what you're doing to your community's water resource. He knows how to do it. Thank, thank you for giving me that much credit. <laughs> Bruce, do you have any thoughts on that around innovation, in, in, especially as it, as, it, as it sort of relates to what you did in, uh, in the Rhine Valley Basin? Yeah. So I think the, you know, the innovation is, of course, something that uh, is very closely related to the research that we are doing. And I think in my experience, uh, it was, uh, you know, we were addressed by these problems uh, in Switzerland, but also, you know, the whole water use issue that came up and, you know, people had to work together from these different disciplines to come up with these solutions. And I think the, the uh, academic field in environmental sciences and engineering is uh, ready to address these issues, I think. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, we just have a, a few minutes left to, to wrap up, and uh, my next question is going to catch Mike a little off, off guard here, but the, how would the potential water value increase associated with the introduction of transport water markets affect the accessibility of portable water to economically disadvantaged communities? So how do you think about water in one community and how it ports itself to another community? Have you got some thoughts on that? And we have that in this in, 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 in California where there's definitely the haves and the have-nots here. If you design a robust system, then the greatest benefit to, to actually disadvantaged communities is not to have to chase the groundwater down. If you put in a system that says, look, provided you drill a, a, a well more than X feet, we promise you the groundwater table will never go below whatever that X feet is. That is the greatest benefit. You cannot move water from one location to another unless you use a pump or a truck. Um, so do not think that what I'm talking about is the solution to everywhere. In some areas, there are limits. In some areas, if people want access to water, they have to live elsewhere. And that's the reality. You cannot magically transport groundwater from one area to another and also surface water from one area to another. Either you cart the water to them or you price water properly and reveal its value, which is what sharing systems do, if you reveal to people the cost of living where you are, they might choose to live somewhere else. And that discipline, if you look at a robust system, applies to a community. If the city of Salinas or of Monterey had to acquire water shares for all the people they have in this area, they might think a lot more about building a desal plant, about recycling systems, about putting very hard, high charges on water and making sure everybody understands how precious water is to the future of a community. If you manage water well, communities respect it and they live and use water in a way that makes economic and social sense. The problem we have at the moment is that water abuse, not use, is the privilege of the rich. And that's why the disadvantaged people are angry throughout much of America. Well, I can't add to that. So I, <laughs> I, I absolutely... Sorry to tell you the truth. <laughs> we can deal with the truth, hopefully. Um, so thanks, everybody. That was a very invigorating uh, session. I, I certainly enjoyed it, learned a lot. Uh, like uh, Dennis had before me, there's still lots of questions I never got to. But um, if you'd like to, uh, I think we have some lunch coming up, and if you see these folks around, please, uh, please badger them uh, with some of your questions. So thanks to the panelists that have come from very far away. Uh, <laughs> and then thanks to Dennis for, for ably uh, stepping in at the last minute. So thank you very much. All right.